In this two-part series, we're going to talk about podcasting and streaming microphones. And in the second part, we'll talk about voiceover microphones. In the first part of this series, we'll talk about podcasting and live streaming microphones. Now, there's no hard and fast rule, but I want to talk about the kind of general differences between them, and then that will help you hopefully decide what makes more sense for your particular situation. So this is just going to be talking about microphones I have personally used, and in most cases that I've owned, so you can hear samples of them on my particular voice. It's just a data point. This is not a definitive review that will identify the perfect microphone because a I don't believe there is a perfect microphone and b your voice is different than mine your preferences for what kind of sound you like is different is potentially different than mine uh, there's just so many factors so let's just go ahead and have a discussion here tell you what I know about these microphones and hopefully that will help you in your decision about which microphone makes most sense for you so first let's talk about another thing that I think is a little bit of a myth some people are of the opinion that you can use any microphone in the world and in post, you can use an equalizer or an EQ plugin to tweak the sound to make it sound like any other microphone in the world or make it sound perfect on your voice. And while I agree that an EQ or an equalizer is a great tool and it, you can do a ton with it, you can often make two different microphones sound very, very similar, like a lavalier microphone and a boom microphone, it doesn't always hold true that you can make it sound like any microphone or you can fix problems that may result when recording with a particular microphone. Let me give you some examples. So for people that have a lot of sibilance in their voice, and that's the sizzling sound you get when someone says the letter S or C, like I just did here, that's sibilance. And it, some voices have more sibilance than others. Mine tends to have a fair bit of sibilance. So the thing that I find that is if you're using a microphone that's very sensitive in the range where your sibilance happens to be, there's no amount of EQ you can take to remove the harmonic distortions that end up there in that frequency range once you've recorded your voice on that. So my, my take is that it's not always true that you can use any microphone in the world, even the cheapest piece of junk microphone, and in the end, with some good EQ, get the perfect sound. I think you really do need to find a microphone that's going to work best for your particular voice. And so let's talk about some of the factors there. So let's talk first about podcasting and live streaming microphones, which I kind of grouped together, and then contrast that with voiceover microphones, because I think there is a difference in many cases. So first of all, for podcasting, when I'm talking about an audio podcast in particular, the voice that you record is the entire presentation. That is it. That is what your audience hears. There's nothing for them to see. So it's 100% audio input for your content. And... So what that means is you have to present something to your audience that's easy to listen to, that they don't have to crank the volume way up to hear, that they don't have to jog the volume dial back and forth to adjust to your volume changes or your the volume changes between you and maybe one of your other hosts or guests. So there are just a lot of factors there. So those are some things you have to work out. But also, the audio doesn't have to be so awesome that it melts your audience and they just tune into your audience because they don't care what you're saying. They just want to hear your voice. Uh, that doesn't, you don't have to go, you know, so far and, and spend so much money and so much time that uh, it sounds like the best audio recording anyone's ever heard. But what you do need to do is you have to meet kind of a basic threshold. There's a threshold below which you're going to lose your audience. And that is if the audio is so bad that there's so much distracting ambient noise that's being captured that you get these wild fluctuations in volume. Those are the kind of things you have to avoid. So let's talk about what goes into making a good recording. I think one of the things that we find with podcasting and live streaming is that a lot of times the recording is done or the live streaming is done in environments that are not acoustically treated or not acoustically treated well. So let me talk about that for just a minute especially for live streaming, like gamers, they have typically a PC in their room. They've got fans going often with those custom builds. They've got a ton of fans going. And yes, I understand they're using Noctua fans and they're low RPM and they're larger. They don't make as much noise. That's all great, but it's still noise. And it's still sound that's generated in the room and it will still be picked up by a good microphone. So you do have to be careful still, even with the best fans. And also if you have bare walls, 
or even walls that have stuff on them, but they're hard surfaces, hard floors, hard ceilings. Those are all surfaces that the sound is going to bounce off of and then bounce back into your microphone. And you'll get this echo sort of effect, which is technically reverb. So that can be really distracting for your audience as well. So if you're going to be recording a live stream, a podcast, or maybe even voiceover in a room that's not acoustically treated, my general advice is you probably want to go with a dynamic microphone and probably not want to go, in most cases, with a condenser microphone. So the reason for that is that dynamic microphones generally do a little bit better in those cases where they don't pick up as much ambient noise. They are usually have a very directional polar pattern, so they have a cardioid polar pattern. So anything coming in from the back of the mic here is not going to be picked up nearly as much as anything from the front of the mic here. So you have that working for you. But also, you basically have to work up right on top of them for them to even pick up your voice. <laughs> so any sound that's happening over here, it's not going to pick up as much of that. And so this is just going to work in your favor. Now, there's also a cost to that. You do need to have a preamplifier or an audio interface or something that you plug it into, usually with an XLR cable, that has a very good preamplifier and good analog to digital converters because you're going to be pushing these preamplifiers hard. These kind of microphones, dynamic microphones, require a lot of amplification, which is called gain. Sometimes on some devices it's just called input. Um, but in any case, what that is is that is amplification. It's taking the very weak signal from the microphone and boosting it up to a usable level. So that's the downside of using a dynamic microphone. Now, it's not really a downside. It's just something you have to keep in mind. And you have to budget for a gear that will drive a good microphone like this. So those are some considerations there. So with that, let's get you some samples. First of all, you've been listening this entire time so far to the Shure SM7B. It's a wonderful microphone. You'll notice on the back here, you have a couple of options here. You can uh, change the sound a little bit, so you can sculpt it by adding a high-pass filter. A high-pass filter is going to cut off some of the low frequencies, so if this is too boomy sounding for your particular voice, you might want to engage that high-pass filter, and it will cut off some of that bass, and it will sound a little bit more natural if that's the sound you're going for. In addition to that, it also has a high-frequency or presence boost. So if you have a particularly, what I would call, a dark voice, that's a voice where you have maybe a good bit of low-frequency energy in your voice, a lot of bass, but you don't have a lot of articulation and you certainly don't have much in the way of sibilance. The problem with those kind of voices when you're recording them, it's not the, well, I guess the problem with a microphone when you're recording those types of voices is that they don't sound very articulate. And sometimes they can start to sound woofy. And in fact, I've had, um, in fact, recently Gerald Undone described his voice on this microphone as a mouthful of mud. And I think that's really a good description for people that have that type of voice is that it can start to sound just really muddy and um, wooly. And that's not a great sound. Some people at first think, oh, that's amazing sound. It sounds like FM radio announcer. Um, but the problem is it's hard for your audience to really hear that, especially if they're going to be listening in a moving car, in a train, an airplane, or other loud environments where they're just using earbuds or something like that. Even the best earbuds <laughs> still generally you can only boost the level so high before you start damaging your hearing. So it's really important, I think, to get a recording that's easy for people to listen to. And so that's what that high frequency presence boost can do. If you have a darker voice that doesn't have a lot of articulation or sibilance in it, you might want to boost that up and it will just make your voice sound a little clearer. When I talk about each of the microphones, I'll tell you whether I purchased them with my own money or they were given to me for free, usually from the manufacturer. This one I bought with my own money. It ran, um, I think it's... $400 US at the time of this particular video. So I think it used to be 350, but the price has gone up. It's become very popular amongst podcasters. And, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a good sound. Is it a natural sound? Not exactly, but natural isn't necessarily always the goal. Just depends on your preferences. But it is a good microphone for when you're going to be recording in spaces that are not necessarily the best acoustically. And you'll be able to work up nice and close on it like this. I think this microphone will also work better for people that have uh, brighter voices. That is to say a little bit more articulation, a little bit more sibilance. This tends to roll some of that off. So this actually is my main microphone I use now for streaming because it kind of complements my voice a little bit better than some other of the options we'll talk about. Now, we're gonna bring up a microphone here that has been popular in the audio world for many, many years. I'm not here to say that this is the best microphone for podcasting or live streaming. 
I don't think it is. I don't use it that often, but I do have a soft spot in my heart for this microphone. It's a Shure SM58. It is the very first uh, dynamic microphone that I purchased in my audio career. I've owned it for now probably 10, oh, more than that, 12 or 14 years. It's nearly in pristine condition. It doesn't get a ton of use, but if I do live sound, this one will usually get pulled out. If you're on a tight budget, it might not be a bad option for a first podcasting mic. Now, it's not perfect, and it... Let me, let me talk about some of its flaws. So this is one that's been around since I believe the 1970s, maybe 60s. I can't remember the whole history of the mic, but it is a kind of iconic sound. And it's designed for voice, so it's a vocal microphone. It's mostly for stage performance, but um, it does have kind of a nice warm low end to it and also pretty crisp on the high end for some voices as well. Um, but I think if you have a very dark voice without a lot of articulation, this may not be a great fit. I don't feel like it um, It can get a little wooly sounding, especially if you work up nice and close on it like this. This is just to show you what we would call the proximity effect, where you get a lot more bass response when you're working up very close on the microphone. Now, one of the problems with this microphone is plosives. When I say the letter P, like please bring pizza pronto, or Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, you probably got some plosives there. And those are... Sometimes you can fix those in post, but many times you can't. So you want to prevent that from happening. So if you do go with a microphone like this, you will want to get a foam cover to put on the head to help dissipate those little puffs of air that come out of your mouth when you say the letter P or B. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. You can also use a pop filter, um, which is just a little piece of mesh that you put between the microphone and your voice. And that also does the same thing where it dissipates the little puff of air before it hits a microphone capsule. So those are some considerations there. Is this a highly recommended mic for podcasting? Probably not. Is it something I would potentially use for panel discussions? If I had a panel discussion, uh, live vocals, yeah, I would potentially pull it out. And it's another option that I have in my kit overall. It's a fine way if you want to kind of get started with podcasting, but you don't want to invest $400 in a microphone. Here's a way you can invest $100 in a microphone, and you'll still have a microphone that can either easily be resold or be used for other purposes. So, for example, maybe when you have a guest, you put them on this and you have your other fancy microphone that fits your voice better. So there's some thoughts on the Shure SM58. Next up, we have the Audio-Technica AT2005. There's also a, another microphone from the same company, the ATR2100, which is basically the same microphone. I think the warranty might be a little different. The... Uh, 2100 is silver instead of black. Otherwise, it sounds, I think, pretty much identical. The switch is a little different, but otherwise very similar. So what's the advantage of this microphone? Number one, the price can be less than the Shure SM58 or 57, which we looked at previously. Um, and it has some additional features. So this actually may be a better choice for podcasting potentially. This one sounded a little brighter to me than the than some of the other microphones. So those people, again, with this very bright sort of articulation and sibilance, this can be a little bit harsh in those frequencies. But overall, I think it's a really good sound. I'll let you be the judge of that for yourself, at least on my particular voice here. Uh, so for those with darker voices, this one may actually be a very good, maybe a pretty good choice as far as dynamic microphones are concerned. It does have an on-off switch which is good and bad. I found that it's good from the standpoint that if you need to, you know, mute something for a while, you can turn it off. That's good. It's not so good if you forget and you're like, why, you know, or you get halfway through your recording and you realize, oh, I've never, I haven't recorded anything yet because I had the off switch in the off position. Now, obviously you should typically be monitoring to make sure, but in any case, that's one feature it has. Another thing it has is a USB output. So you can go from this microphone directly into your computer without using any sort of other audio interface or mixing board or anything else. And so that's a real convenience feature. The only downside is that the sound quality when you use that USB output is not quite as good in my opinion as a lot of other mixing boards or audio interfaces would be. So the nice thing about this mic is you have choices. You can use the XLR output into your own audio interface or mixer or recorder, and you'll get a great sound in most cases. Or if you just need something that's really light, really small, and you just want to take the microphone and a USB cable, you can do that as well. 
I think there's a little bit of sacrifice in audio quality. And I have another video where we actually reviewed this in more depth, which you can go take a look at and get some samples both ways. Another nice feature on this is it has a headphone jack on the microphone itself. So you can actually plug your headphones directly in there and listen and monitor and make sure that what you're getting, you know, that there aren't any problems, that everything's recording okay. So that's another nice feature on the Audio-Technica AT2005 and ATR2100. Now, before we move off this microphone, there's another one that's very popular out there that is kind of similar to this. It's called the Samson Q2U, I believe. Um, people really like that microphone. A lot of podcasters really like it. It's inexpensive. It's less than $100. The nice thing about it is that it's less than $100. It sounds good on most people's voices. Um, and I think it has the same feature set here. The difference is, in my experience, and actually this, this mic is not immune to it either, but the Q2U, from my experience, seems very, very prone to pick up plosives. So when you say P and B, um, like we'll do here, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Um, it's The Q2U in particular seems to pick those up really readily. So if you do use that microphone, I think you really, you really do need to invest in the foam wind cover. Not a big deal. Those are inexpensive, and that's a great solution as well. This is the Electrovoice RE20, which is a $450 microphone. So this is not a budget microphone, <laughs> but this is a professional broadcast dynamic microphone. And this one has some interesting features. First of all, you can see by its design here, it's a little bit different than we've seen on some of the other microphones. It has this long, longer tube. It's a much wider diameter. I find that most of the wider diameter microphones generally sound to have a little bit more of that broadcast sound, that rich low end to them. This is no exception. Um, this one has a couple of things. Number one, like the SM7B, it also has a high pass filter. Let me go ahead and turn that on here. That's with the high pass filter turned on now relative to before when I first started talking on this, we had the high pass filter turned off. Also probably in many cases easier to think of that as a low cut filter. So it gets rid of some of that bassy stuff, makes it sound a little bit more natural. Depends on the sound you want. This is now with the high pass filter turned off. So the nice thing about this microphone is, first of all, you have that high pass filter so you can choose. And if you've got a, a variety of different microphones and this one's sounding really, really wooly or bassy, you can always use that high pass filter to get it kind of in the same ballpark as some of the other microphones you're using. Because of the inbuilt pop filter and this long tube here, you're much less likely to experience plosives with this microphone. So it has all this material in here that diffuses those puffs of air before they get to the capsule. So you're much less likely to get those. That's a good thing. Um, so in terms of microphone technique, it's pretty easy for someone to learn how to use this microphone. They just need to stay up on it. Like right now, I'm about three inches away from it. So um, what else can I tell you about this microphone? Again, I paid $450, bought it myself. So nobody's twisting my arm to say <laughs> anything special about this. Um, I will say this. This microphone has a special magnet in it, as I understand, I think that is supposed to make it sound more like a condenser microphone. It's supposed to have much more response up in the higher frequencies. And in fact, I think you can hear that on my voice in particular, it's just not a great fit because again, that sibilance tends to get, at least in my opinion, and from my hearing, it just gets a little too prominent. It's a little too harsh. Some people like that sound again, but this is not typically a microphone I would use on a bright voice or a voice with a lot of sibilance. Um, However, what I find is my wife's voice sounds really good on this. <laughs> so typically when we are doing any sort of recording together and, sh and we're doing vocals, she'll use this microphone. My voice, not such a great fit, but it could be a good fit for yours. Again, it's better probably for darker voices or, da or voices that don't have a whole lot of sibilance to them. It's also not a budget mic, but it's a solid mic that could serve you for a m several decades easily. So while at $450 seems like a price that's a little bit on the steep side, it is a microphone that could serve you for a lot of years. So there is a listen to a variety of different dynamic microphones and how they might be a good fit for you or maybe not such a great fit for you, depending on the sound of your voice, the sound you prefer to listen to in terms of how crisp you want something, how articulate and how much sibilance you like to hear. Um, so hopefully that was helpful from that standpoint. Now you might ask yourself, couldn't I just use these as voiceover microphones as well? And the answer is yes, of course you could. However, what I will say is that typically when you're doing voiceover recording, you're looking for a little bit more detail, especially in the higher frequencies. And what happens with most dynamic microphones is once they get past about 15, 
kilohertz in terms of the overall frequency spectrum, they tend to roll off. And that's actually not a bad thing if you're recording in an acoustic environment where there's, you know, other stuff going on. But when you're doing voiceover and you want that additional detail, then a lot of times you're going to want to move to a condenser microphone that are typically a little bit more articulate and more sensitive up in the higher frequencies. So that's where there's kind of a difference there. And in the next episode, when we talk about condenser microphones for voiceover, you'll hear a pretty substantial difference there. One note, microphone placement is really important. With dynamic microphones, you have to be up close to them to get the best sound out of them. And you, I know you've seen probably a thousand videos with people sitting like a foot away from their Shure SM7B. A, they may not actually be that far away. It may be kind of a camera perspective thing. And B, it may not be the most optimal setup <laughs> uh, if you do operate in that way, if you get that far away from the microphone. Really, a dynamic microphone, you're supposed to be up pretty close on it to get the best signal to noise ratio. That is to say, capturing your voice and not picking up a lot of the ambient noise in the room. So hopefully that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.